I was sitting in my buddy's spare bedroom, looking at my smartphone connected to my apartment's internal surveillance cameras. I heard something coming from my bedroom. It turned out that my fiancé was with my best man and groom, who 12 hours earlier had partied with me over the weekend. Friday, they took me to the Gold Coast in Queensland. Saturday was a day at the races, and then a big night at the casino. Sunday morning, I lazed lazily by the pool at the resort. Tom, my best man, and Carl, one of the groom's friends, said goodbye to us. They couldn't get off work on Monday, so they had to leave early to get back to Sydney. Toward noon, we were getting ready to leave again when hotel security paid us a visit. One of the cleaning ladies had found a bag of pills, called security, and they came and confiscated them. On top of several noise complaints from the previous night, they asked us to leave. No arguments from even one of my buddies who was a lawyer could change their minds. We tried to get rooms elsewhere, but accommodating 10 guys on a cup weekend on short notice was impossible. So we headed to the airport, tails up, and boarded a red-eye flight to Sydney. Arriving just before 11 p.m., we split up, but my two remaining fiancé wouldn't let me go back to the apartment. Come on, Adam, it's still your weekend. You're not going back to work until Wednesday, so come over to my place and we'll have a few more drinks. I was getting a little nauseous from all the drinking. However, I realized that the guys had put a lot of effort into this weekend, so I agreed, and we got in a cab to head to Tony's house. My fiancé Georgia was having her bachelorette party in Sydney. I tried to call her but wasn't surprised when the message went to voicemail. I didn't bother leaving a message as I was sure she wouldn't be able to sort it out until morning anyway. Georgia moved in with me two months ago. Her lease was up. I had recently bought a two-bedroom penthouse in the city, so it was silly for her to sign a lease for another six months. Her parents weren't thrilled about it, but we were supposed to be married in three months. They were strict Catholics, but they liked me, and I think the fact that I was the youngest executive in my bank to receive a million-dollar bonus helped. Back at Tony's house, the guys must have confused upstairs and downstairs, because within half an hour they were both snoring in the chaise lounges. I headed to one of the bedrooms and prepared myself for some much-needed sleep. My phone beeped, signifying that a text message had arrived. I expected to see something from Georgia, but was surprised to see the number of the man who lived below my apartment. Give me a break. Some of us have to work tomorrow. I read the message, then reread it again. It didn't make any sense. No one was supposed to be home, so he must have sent the message to the wrong number. I replied to let him know that the message hadn't found its intended recipient. My phone buzzed again. Another message. Yeah, sure, just put that bitch away and go to bed or gag her. You must be very talented to write a reply while your fiancé is squealing so loudly. Now I was puzzled. He obviously thought he had the right number. What on earth was going on? Luckily, I had a way to find out without moving an inch. My penthouse had been renovated by the previous tenant only three years ago. She was the daughter of a Singaporean billionaire who was in graduate school at the University of Sydney. He was an overprotective father and insisted on installing remote access cameras in the living room and bedrooms. When I signed the contract to buy the apartment, the agent familiarized me with the system and set it up on my smartphone. I've only used it a couple times. There's not much of interest in empty rooms. I logged in with my passwords and a menu loaded, asking me which camera I wanted to view. I chose the living room, and the first thing I noticed were empty beer bottles, wine glasses, a bong, and a bag of various pills on the coffee table. Spinning the camera around, I didn't find any people, but there were items of clothing scattered around the living room. Noise was coming from other areas of the apartment, so with a heavy heart, I switched the camera to the bedroom to investigate. Moonlight streamed through the open curtains, illuminating the tangle of bodies on my bed. I heard a conversation and I think I know that voice. Damn. This was only getting worse. Mine was entertaining my fiancé, and judging by the voice, not for the first time. I sank down on the bed, unable to believe it, but it was right in front of me. My ex-fiancé was a slut, and my supposed friends were bitches. I wanted to smash and then bury these bastards, but as I realized from my business dealings, I needed leverage and a plan. 
If I was going to hurt them as much as they were hurting me, I had to take my time and do it right. I went back to the security menu and checked to see if it was recording. The hard drive held 24 hours of recordings that were deleted if they weren't downloaded. The lighting wasn't great. Clouds obscured the full moon, so the video wouldn't be clear. Plus, Tom and Carl were such big favorites. They chatted a lot about how they'd had fun before, Georgia responded, so I had plenty of ammunition. When they climaxed, Georgia got up and went to the bathroom. The guys went to the kitchen, got some drinks, and went back to the bedroom. I can't wait to see you in your wedding dress, Tom said. I won't get it until the day before, so you'll have to wait until the honeymoon. Georgia replied that she always thought ahead. Absolutely not. We're talking about the day of the wedding, picked up Carl. And how are you going to do that? Georgia laughed. I went with Adam when he paid for the reception at the hotel. The ballroom where the reception will be held has a room on one side for the orchestra. The guys will take turns distracting Adam while the rest of you entertain. Tom, a smug jerk, explained. All four of you? Would you have it any other way? Asked Carl with a chuckle. I guess not. You know I won't be taking birth control. Adam wants to have kids right away. You guys are going to be playing Russian roulette. Georgia sighed. How could I have been so blind? I disconnected from the security system, having had enough. The hard drive, located in a hidden closet behind my closet, kept recording everything that happened. I lay on my back and tried to work on my revenge. Inspiration wasn't coming, so I got up and walked out into the living room. Tony and Jeff were still snoring. Tony was lying with his legs spread. It took a lot of willpower for me not to hit him. I grabbed a beer from the fridge and was leafing through an old newspaper on the kitchen bench when I noticed a headline and inspiration hit me. Police warn against drinking alcohol. Police feared there was a group of men who would pick up intoxicated young women, follow them home, then break in. They urged women to be more cautious and to keep an eye on their friends. They also asked for any information that could help them find the perpetrators. As I pondered how to use this to my advantage, my phone buzzed again. It was my downstairs neighbor informing me that he had filed a noise complaint with the police. Great. I went back to the bedroom and immediately called the police. You've reached the New South Wales police. What can we do for you? Oh my God. You have to get into my apartment. Oh my God. I think my fiancé is in trouble. I was as hysterical as possible. Calm down, sir. Can you give me some details? How can I calm down? You must call someone immediately. Why do you think this is happening, sir? The girl remained remarkably calm. My neighbor is complaining about the noise, but I'm not there. I'm here. How can I make noise with my fiancé when I'm here? Please, please, send someone over, please. How do you know your neighbor complained? Again, the girl replied nonchalantly. This is going to be harder than I thought. He sent me a message complaining, and then he sent me another one saying he filed a noise complaint. Please send someone. I'm begging you. What address was the noise complaint filed at? This was worse than talking to a call center or one of those computer voices. Thank goodness I didn't need them urgently. I gave her my home address. Please wait a moment. Thirty seconds later, she returned. I'm transferring you. After another 30 seconds, a man's voice sounded. This is Staff Sergeant Potts from the Sex Crimes Unit. May I ask who is calling you? Oh, thank goodness, finally. I'm Adam Spencer. Please send someone for my fiancé. Something terrible is happening. I pretended to start crying. We have a unit in the area. We just need to be sure of something. Is there any chance it's someone other than your fiancé, or maybe she has someone else there? Whimpering didn't help. Time to see if being pissed off would work. We're getting married in three weeks. What the hell do you think? If this procrastination hurts her in any way, I'll sue you and the department. I'll appear on every TV program, write to every newspaper, and use your name. Calm down, sir. We'll look into it. What is your fiancé's name, and what was she supposed to be doing tonight? I had prepared myself a bit for this question. Georgia, 
she was going to go with her friends to a hen party in King's Cross. Okay, like I said, there's a subdivision in the area and they're going to stop by there. Are you calling from your cell phone? We need the number so we can keep you informed. Yes, should I go there too? No, please stay put until we get back to you. He disconnected with those words. It didn't go as well as I had hoped. I wanted them to barge in and raise hell. Nothing happened for 20 minutes. Then my phone buzzed with another text message. It was from my downstairs neighbor. Sorry, dude. Thought it was you up there. The police are on their way up. Guns and helmets and everything. Hope George is okay. Praying for you both. Holy shit. They bought it. I logged back into security. I had to see this. I switched to the living room and moved the camera to the door. No action yet. After three minutes, I thought my neighbor must be messing with me, and then the door slowly opened. Two officers in bulletproof jackets with pistols at the ready entered the living room, combed through it, then signaled and four more came through the door. I went back to my cell in the bedroom and all hell broke loose. Police officers burst through the door with guns raised and headlights on. They were yelling, Armed police! On the floor! Now! Get down! Tom and Carl didn't know what had gotten into them. Carl and Tom are on the floor. Two policemen sit on their backs and handcuff them behind their backs. The boys finally regained their composure. What the hell is this? shouted Tom. That'll be the last girl you see for a while. The policeman roared, pushing Tom against the door jam. What? She sure as hell didn't mind, Carl added. They led the boys out of the room. A policewoman entered and took control of a relieved and blanket-wrapped Georgia. Setting her down in a chair by the window, she began to speak softly, calming the confused Georgia. It's all right, Georgia. You're safe now. The staff sergeant will call your fiancé and ask him to meet us at the hospital. At the hospital? Yes, we will examine you. Would you like your mother to be there too? The hospital has a great team to help you through this difficult time. They have a lot of experience with victims. Georgia looked like a rabbit caught in the headlights of an 18-wheeler truck. Victims! Victims! She stammered. It's okay, honey. They can't hurt you now. Just take your time. The paramedics will be here soon. This is going to be very interesting. Will she try to lie? The pressure on her will be immense. Or will she say it was consensual and show herself to be a slut? Everyone in this room will know she's engaged and about to get married. I switched the camera to see how Tom and Carl were doing. They were sitting in the living room in just their underwear. A plainclothes cop was asking questions about the drugs, but they weren't saying anything. I think you've exceeded the threshold for personal use and have crossed over into the dealer category. That puts you in danger of at least three years in prison, and that's not considering other factors. Help us now and we can all go to bed early. The policeman tried again. The boys sat with stone faces and remained silent. All right, have it your way, the policeman turned to the other officers. Take them to the wagon, bring them to the station, and call them on the phone. The armed officers picked the boys up off the floor and led them out the door. The second officer went to the bedroom door and gestured for the woman to come out. They huddled together and spoke softly, so I couldn't make out what they were saying. After they fell silent, she went back to Georgia and the other guy pulled out his cell phone and made a call. My phone started ringing. Hello? I tried to make my voice sound as anxious as possible. Mr. Spencer, this is Staff Sergeant Potts. What happened? Have you found Georgia? Is she okay? What? My verbal barrage was interrupted by the sergeant. Calm down, Mr. Spencer. We found your fiancé. She'll be taken to the hospital soon. My goodness, is she all right? Yes, this is just a precautionary checkup. I will give you more details at the hospital. We should be at St. Vincent's in about ten minutes. Call me when you arrive and I'll find you and give you the details of our surgery. Before I could add another crazy answer, he hung up. I hailed a cab and walked out of Tony's house. Things had worked out better than I could have hoped but I wasn't sure how the police would take the situation. Would they believe Georgia or Tom and Carl? I would have to be constantly on guard to keep this cauldron from boiling over. At the hospital, a 
A constable met me and led me through the emergency room to a room off to the side. Inside, a tall, thin man with a big hooked nose was talking on the phone. The constable told me to wait, poked his head through the doorway, and told me I was here. The man ended the conversation and hung up, then came to the doorway with his hand outstretched. Staff Sergeant Potts, he said, shaking my hand. Adam Spencer, where is my fiance? She's with the doctor right now. You'll be able to see her shortly. I just want to have a word before you see her. He pointed to a chair behind the desk, moved to the other side and sat down. Clearing his throat, he continued. Five armed officers entered your apartment this evening and detained two men. They are at the police station and are being questioned at the moment. Your fiancé? Georgia, I interrupted. Georgia is being monitored by medical personnel right now. Samples and statements are being taken from her. She'll be finished soon, but in the meantime, I have a few questions for you that will help us get the full picture. Is that really necessary? Of course, Georgia's welfare is more important than anything else right now. I want to see her, muttered I. <laughs> and you will see, sir, but I need to clarify a few things first. He ran his fingers through his thinning hair, then leaned forward and asked, Where are you tonight? Why does it matter? I replied innocently. If you were home, Georgia wouldn't be here right now. Well, yes, I see. I was at a friend's house. I had a weekend away this weekend. We got back late at night from Brisbane, and one of my suitors insisted that I stay with him and another suitor and keep partying. Where was that? In Renwick or one of the nearby eastern suburbs, I think. That what time did your neighbor contact you about the noise? I don't know exactly. I'll check my phone. It should have a texting time on it. I pulled out my phone and looked at the messages. 11.45 p.m. I want to show you a couple of pictures on my phone. They show the men we apprehended. Please tell me if you've seen them before. Is this standard procedure? It's just a hunch. These two don't fit the profile of rapists. They look more like young office workers to me. And he picked up his phone and started flipping through the images while I tried my best to look stunned, then angry. What? Is this a joke? Why do you have pictures of Tom and Carl? Who are Tom and Carl? Tom is my best man. Carl is one of my best men. What do they have to do with this? They're the two naked guys we found in your apartment. Why weren't they at your party? They left Brisbane early. They had to work tomorrow. That's what they said. I slumped down in my chair. I tried my best to look dejected. A voice came from behind me. Excuse me, Mick, can I have a word? It was the policewoman I had seen in my apartment. Could you step outside for a moment, Mr. Spencer? I stood up and headed for the door, leaving my phone on the chair. I had it set to record my conversation with the sergeant, and knowing what they were talking about could be very helpful later. They talked to each other for a bit, and then both left together. I'll be right back with your fiancé. Sorry, Georgia. I pulled out my phone, plugged in my earpiece, and started listening to what they were saying. The policewoman began. We've done all the checks. I've written a statement, but she hasn't signed it yet. How do you feel about that? The sergeant asked. Well, uh, that's why I haven't gotten her to sign it. It seems a bit odd. She definitely had an affair, but I don't think consent was an issue. Her story sounds like a TV script. Maybe we just caught her having one last affair before the wedding. I'm inclined to agree. The two guys in custody don't seem to fit the crime. They're smarmy creeps. Her boyfriend? I can't figure it out. But he looks like he's trying too hard to be shocked. How do you think we should proceed? Come with me and read George's statement. Maybe you'll remember what I forgot to ask. I was a good cop, so before we get her to sign, you can give her a lecture on the penalties for perjury. Okay. How far can I go? Can she lose her temper? We're talking about someone who is a potential victim, even if we're not quite sure. That's what I don't like about her. I don't think she's traumatized. It's more likely that she's genuinely guilty, or maybe she's just worried about getting caught. I think you can scare her and get the real story out of her. Then let's go see it. The sergeant stood up, his chair scraped, and there was silence until I stopped the tape. I sat there, wondering what Georgia would do. 
I checked my watch. It was time to set the wheels of revenge in motion. I looked through my phone's contact list, selected a number, and dialed it. Harold, Eric Town speaking. Eric wrote in the business section. He was also in charge of a dirty little gossip section called CBD. No one admitted to reading it, but everyone did. I met him at a political fundraiser and we hit it off. Hey, Eric, it's Adam. How the hell are you doing? And what are you doing at this ungodly hour? It's a long story I'll tell you later over a beer, but I just wanted to see if your column for tomorrow's issue is ready. I asked hopefully. Just now. I hate the beginning of the fiscal year. It's always awfully quiet on the gossip front at this time. Have you heard anything I should know? His interest peaked. Is it too late to tell me about it? It will be too late if you don't tell me at once. He always showed impatience if he thought he was missing any important news. It would interest you if two young geniuses aspiring to the board of directors were languishing in an interrogation room. Hell yes. That would be the best gossip I've heard in weeks. Can I use names? Please tell me I can use names, pleaded Eric. If you want to get sued, you can use names. It'll be strictly in the category of guess who. Don't get sued. At the end of his columns, Eric would put a section. Guess who? Don't sue. Where all of his unsubstantiated, juicy information without names was placed. Every morning tea break in the city, small clusters of office workers would try to name names. Naughty boy? Now you know how I work. I need a backstory so I can make up my cryptic clues. Spill it, bro. Tom and Carl, said I, trying to keep my voice even. Your best man and stable boy? Are you buying your buddies? Who did they attack? Your mother? My fiancé, or should I say my ex-fiancé? I tried, but I couldn't keep the bitterness out of my voice. Oh. Eric fell silent. Something about his reaction wasn't what I expected. Did you already know about this? I asked. No, I guess I should say I'm not really surprised, he said cautiously. What does that mean? I raised my voice and got a stern look from a nurse walking by. Well, anyway, there have been rumors about Georgia and her boss for some time now. I couldn't figure it out, so I didn't bother mentioning it. She's having fun with her boss, too? I half squealed again. Well, maybe, but... The story was that she was offered as an incentive for potential clients. Eric said, embarrassed. Damn it. How could I have been so blind? It's called love, Adam. Anyway, do you want me to explode? That's exactly why I called to burn the bastards. Consider it done. We said our goodbyes and disconnected. A policewoman was walking towards me down the hall. She had a very good figure and walked with confidence. Women in uniform. She stopped in front of me. I'm Constable Haven. Do you mind if I have a word with you? Georgia will be here soon, and hopefully I can help you both get through this trauma together. Not likely, I thought. But I put on a smiley face and let her counsel me. It was a little tedious. Georgia walked over to me with Sergeant Potts beside her. I stood up and gave the appearance of a concerned husband-to-be. I moved towards them and took Georgia in my arms. She started to cry, and I stroked her back and head like a sad puppy reassuring her and telling her that everything would be okay, that I would be there for her and all that. In the back of my mind, I was making plans. Three of my wedding party were in trouble, but there were still two more to go. The two policemen gave me their business cards and we left. On the way home, Georgia sat and snorted and thanked me, telling me how wonderful I was and how much she loved me. Back at our apartment, I started cleaning up, Georgia seemed very eager to get me into bed. I mentally flagged that I needed to check in with the doctor. Come on, baby, I need you to hold me, Georgia said. I just want to get cleaned up and you go to bed. I'll be there soon. Fatigue must have come over her because she gave up and went to bed. I had a lot to do. First, I downloaded the video from my hard drive and watched it. It was perfect. From the moment they entered my apartment, it was obvious that no rape had taken place. One charge of filing a false complaint. Maybe if the prosecutor wanted to pervert the course of justice. They said they took the drugs from Tony. 
Later, they went even further. Georgia asked why they had so much, and they said Tony had just made a big purchase. He needed extra money, so they lent him some. They hope to double it in the next couple weeks when Tony moves the merchandise. Slam dunk. Three counts of possession with intent to distribute. They might be able to find good enough lawyers to stay out of jail, but their business careers were in jeopardy. After that, the three of them went into business, and I still needed to find something on Jeff if he was involved. I'd originally thought I'd send the CCTV footage to the police around noon, but given that the sergeant was dead set against me, I decided to call now. At three in the morning, I thought I'd just get their message, but it would show that I wasn't trying to hide something. I dialed the sergeant's number first and was surprised when he answered. Hello, Staff Sergeant Potts. He sounded annoyed. I hoped I hadn't woken him up. This is Adam, Adam Spencer. I met you at the hospital when I was picking up my fiance. I didn't wake you up, did I? No, of course not. I work the night shift. I don't go to bed until eight in the morning. His mood was not improving. Look, I don't want to take up your time, but mom, I paused as if trying to hold back. There are three security cameras in my apartment hooked up to a hard drive. I snorted and cleared my throat. I needed to try and sell this. Ah, yes, he said, interested. Why didn't you say something before? Were you looking at her? I could almost see him suddenly sit up straight, leaning forward expectantly. I guess with everything that's been going on, I must have forgotten. I, 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 me. I paused again and blew my nose. I'm sorry, it's hard. You know, I looked at him and, and, I stopped completely, and the sergeant bit down hard on the bait. What? What did you see, Adam? Adam? Are you still there? I... I don't think it was a rape. They... Oh my God, they came in together, laughing and kissing. I let out a strangled cry and pretended to sob. And the drugs had nothing to do with it? demanded the sergeant. I didn't see much after that, but they were putting them on the coffee table. I lied. I need to see that tape. There are two high-powered legal eagles here, making a fuss about lawsuits. And can you send it to me? I think I can email it to you. Wait, I'll give you the address. We need to get it fast. He gave me the address and hung up. I went to the computer and sent a copy of all the footage from the three cameras to it. I went to the spare room and tried to go to sleep, but I just lay there with my eyes closed. I couldn't believe I had judged the character of my girlfriend and my buddies so poorly. Somewhere around five, the phone rang. Excuse me, I hope you weren't in a deep sleep. It was Sergeant Potts, and his voice sounded much more cheerful. I was in bed, but I'm having trouble falling asleep, I said sharply. Yeah, well, that's understandable, given the circumstances. Look, I won't keep you up. Could we meet for coffee when I get off at eight? There are a few events I want to talk to you about. Sure, I don't have any plans. There was a strong sense of bitterness in my reply. There's a coffee shop in Surrey Hills, not far from the Oxford Tavern. Do you know it? Yeah, just don't go in there. Too many cops. Yeah, I guess there is. I'll see you at eight then. He passed out, and I started lying around again trying to sleep. I got up at 7 a.m. and took a shower. Georgia was still sound asleep or at least pretending to be asleep. I doubt she really wanted to talk to me until she had time to come up with a story. I flipped through the morning television programs, trying to find something to take my mind off the past 24 hours. The lead story on the 7.30 News soon caught my attention. Police officers conducted a pre-dawn raid in the coastal suburb of Bronte. A two-story house was searched, and two men involved in a drug trafficking ring were arrested. Neighbors of the house said the occupant was a pleasant young man who worked at a bank in the city. Police have not yet released any details. They have also detained other people who they hope can help them in their investigation. Oh yeah, screw you bastards. Sergeant Potts would be pleased. And then I got dressed and was about to go out to meet the sergeant when I remembered my conversation with the gossip columnist. I went back to the computer and checked the online supplement. At the bottom of the CBI column, under the bold headline, Guess Who Won't Sue, 
It read, Which high-profile PR and girl about town is postponing her upcoming wedding after she was caught in the act with a couple of newlyweds? Unfortunately, her former fiancé and a rising star in the private banking business was not among them. Delightful. The suits in town will be happily chatting at the water cooler in the morning. Suddenly, I thought of George's parents. They were very nice people and didn't deserve to learn about the upcoming problem secondhand. I called them immediately. Jack, George's father, answered. Hey, Adam, how's the buck weekend going? They ended early after some fight in Brisbane. Could I meet up with you and Janice this morning? What happened, Adam? I felt the tremor in his voice. I don't want to talk about it over the phone, Jack, I said softly. It has nothing to do with this morning's paper? Jack had worked in the city all his life and had retired three years ago. He still read the business section first thing every morning. I'll tell you later, Jack. Can you come into town? They deserve to be told everything face to face. Okay, we'll be there around 11. Where do you want to meet? He seemed resigned to getting the bad news. How about that little pastry shop by your old office building? They still bake the best cakes and treats there. Okay. I'll see you there. Just one thing, Adam. Please don't make any rash decisions until you know everything, pleaded Jack. I already know too much, Jack. I'm sorry. I felt tears come to my eyes for real this time. After saying goodbye, I walked out the door. It was a gorgeous sunny day in Sydney. Late fall is always the best. The sun isn't so scorching anymore, and the humidity is generally lower. I decided to walk to the meeting being a little late, but I didn't care. And then Sergeant Potts was just about to leave when I entered the cafe. I thought you bankers were punctual, he reprimanded. I'm still on vacation. I lowered myself grumpily into the chair across from where he was standing. He sat down across from me, his frown replaced by a smile. Lucky for you, we got a result last night. The CCTV footage was very informative, we couldn't use it as evidence, but it gave us enough information to work through them. We split them up, so when we started asking about the purchase of the lot, they both assumed the other had sold them. The waitress came over and I ordered an orange juice and the sergeant got warm milk. Police aren't what they used to be. Taking a sip, he continued. We got Tony's name from them, and then we searched the house and found more. The narcotics division was thrilled. Tony was quiet for a while but when we told what we'd learned from the other two, he gave in. He's trying to cut a deal and give up the name of his supplier. And what's going to happen to them now? The first two have been ordered to appear at a bail hearing tomorrow morning, possibly Tony too if he can get a deal with the prosecutor. A public hearing? I asked hopefully. Oh yeah, he grinned. Their lawyers are trying to get an extraordinary hearing, but the prosecutor wants it in the media. So do you, it seems. He lifted the neatly folded Morning Herald from his lap, unfolding the CBI column. I... I don't know what you mean. I tried to look innocent. A likely story. I wonder if your surveillance system has remote access. He leaned back in his chair with an amused expression on his face. I bet it also has a time map that lets you know what time it was checked. Maybe I should get a warrant and see for myself. Why chase the victim? Maybe by the time you get a warrant, the hard drive will already be corrupted. The sergeant's smile turned to laughter, and when he got himself under control, he sat forward and said in a low voice, Keep your shirt on, Adam. You've just confirmed my suspicions. I'm not interested in you, but I want to know what you want to happen to Georgia. What do you mean? Well, you could be charged with perjury. Of course it won't be charged. I'm sure she can get it dismissed as a first offense or maybe we'll just forget about it. It's hardly worth wasting time filling out paperwork unless you're hungry for retribution. And from the looks of it, you are. He picked up the paper again to emphasize his point. I'm not quite sure what you mean. I played dumb. Okay, you're a careful guy. Call me after six tonight if you want me to press charges or I'll bury it. He got up and walked away, leaving me to ponder the choice. I finished my juice and walked out into the bright sunlight. I continued walking towards the city. The next part of my revenge was to show up to work disheveled and depressed.
This would leave gossip readers wondering who was involved. Humiliation would be no fun for me, but I guess it was one way to ensure that Tom and Carl's spots at the bank would soon be vacated. When I entered the lobby of the bank, it started with one of the guards elbowing another and pointing in my direction. This continued as I walked to the elevators. I got on the first one and was joined by several others. The mailman rushed in with his cart just as the doors were closing. Obviously, he hadn't read the business section of the Herald. Adam, how was your weekend? The secretary pretended to lose her balance and kicked the cart into the mailman's shins. Ow! Careful, miss! The elevator stopped on the next floor, and he got out, still rubbing his shins. For the rest of the ride, the others were silent. They suddenly thought the floor was very interesting. I was going to the top floor, since I was hoping to get to the CEO's office, and by then, the only one left there was the receptionist, who silenced the mail guy. Just before she left, she put her hand on my shoulder, and I turned to face her. I'm sorry about what happened. If you need someone to talk to or cry to, here's my number. She shoved a slip of paper in my hand, and then walked away. I looked at the number. I hadn't seen her write anything in the elevator, so it must have been written earlier. I rolled up the note and tossed it in the nearest trash can. I think she probably had a whole stack of them in her pocket. I headed for the CEO's office. His secretary was a formidable woman with a sharp tongue. She sat behind a high desk and looked at people through glasses, fixed on the tip of her nose. I walked into her office and she lowered her eyes as befitted her, ignoring the intrusion into her day. I waited for her to stop her intended task. I earned her wrath for speaking before she did. She raised her head like a cobra waiting to strike, but softened when she saw me. Adam, darling, what are you doing here? You have two more days off. I'd never seen or heard her be the least bit conciliatory, let alone call anyone darling. Today, I was just wondering if I could see Mr. Turnbull for a moment. I felt myself blush at her sympathetic look. He's taking a break between calls right now. I'll just see if I can do that. She slid off the chair and walked over to the door, knocked and peeked inside to ask. I had never seen her standing, and she was quite short, which explained the presence of the chair and table. She came back with a smile and said, Mr. Turnbull will be right with you. Just have a seat. She climbed back into the chair and I sat down. She went back to her work, then stopped and looked up again. She opened her mouth to say something, then stopped. I could almost see the wheels turning in her head as she contemplated continuing. Eventually, speech took over. I was abandoned at the altar. At least you found out about it in time. As soon as she said it, I think she regretted it. Before I could think of a response, her head bowed again, and she went back to work. Well, if I convinced her, then it should be easy with the CEO. Mr. Turnbull came to the door and invited me in. He was a tall man with short-cropped curly hair that had grayed at the edges. He kept himself in shape and could often be seen jogging in the park at lunchtime. He returned to the chair at his desk and gestured for me to sit across from him. Adam, I wasn't expecting to see you this morning, but given the circumstances, perhaps it would be best if we hear the story from you today rather than later in the week. I was silent for a moment as Mar. Turnbull shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Which means that, if there's anything you want to tell me. Mr. Turnbull seemed to be quite nervous, which was unlike him. But there was no point in procrastinating. S I came here to ask you for time off for the rest of the week, as I am currently dealing with some personal issues. But since these personal issues concern other employees of the firm and the PR firm hired by the firm, I suppose you have a right to know. Yes, otherwise I wouldn't be asking. Mar Turnbull defended himself. I took a deep breath and cleared my throat for a moment, then began my hatchet job. Last night I got back to Sydney from a weekend retreat my father was hosting earlier than planned. I was at one of my fiancé's house when I got a text from a neighbor about a noise coming from my apartment. At first I thought he had the wrong number, but when he continued to persist, I called the police figuring someone had broken into my apartment, and maybe Georgia was in trouble. 
The police arrived and entered the apartment where they seized drugs and found my fiancé with Tom and Carl. I stopped, pulled out a handkerchief, blotted my eyes and wiped my nose. There were no tears, but the impression was left wanting. Oh dear, oh dear, muttered Mr. Turnbull, seating himself forward at his desk and eagerly awaiting the continuation. Tom, Carl, and another of my suitors, Tony, are now in custody. Oh dear, oh dear, not good for the firm. Not good at all. What did Georgia say about it? Did not. I don't know, I haven't spoken to her since I spoke to the police this morning. Oh dear, a terrible case, a terrible case. It's safe to say we're not going to let those two back through the front doors again. Take as much time as you want, call me on Monday, and we'll talk further. He leaned back in his chair, pulling away from me with visible relief. At that moment, the whole picture became clear to me. I walked toward the door, glad that Tom and Carl would be out of a job. I turned and asked a question. What about the PR firm? Immediately he looked like a cat on a hot tin roof again. Ah, yes. Well, there needs to be an internal investigation into this, since Tom and Carl were in charge of the tender process. I'll talk to Jeremy, their CEO, and we'll work something out. His face flushed. He was sweating. He was hiding something. Considering what Eric had told me about Georgia's role in her firm, I also remembered Tom and Carl laughing about Mar. Turnbull was taking an active part in the bidding process. I put two and two together and concluded that it was the other guy who was entertaining my fiancé. I kept walking. He would be delayed. But I now realized that unless I launched a tactical nuclear strike, I would not be able to get revenge on all the guys who entertained my fiancé. And I caught a cab to the bakery I was meeting George's parents at. I was early, so I ordered coffee. Pulling out my phone, I decided to log into my security system and see if Georgia was out of bed. She was sitting in the kitchen, drinking coffee and frantically texting on her phone. A couple minutes later, she was already standing at the intercom, inviting someone to enter the building. She sprinted to the entryway, opened the door, and there stood the fourth bastard. My second fiancé, Jeff. Georgia stood on her toes, trying to kiss him, but he dodged her and made his way inside. I switched the camera to the living room as they walked inside. He seemed to be trying to keep his distance between himself and Georgia. It was like two boxers in the ring examining each other. Georgia was aggressive, trying to corner her opponent to land the decisive blows, while Jeff danced away. Jeff had the advantage of being able to use the furniture as a shield. Eventually, Georgia settled into a chaise lounge, and Jeff took a seat in the chair opposite. I couldn't hear what they were talking about since, being in a busy public place, I didn't have the sound on. She threw herself at him, wrapping her arms around his neck and resting her head on his shoulder. I looked up to make sure her parents hadn't arrived yet, and when I looked back, the picture had subtly changed. At that moment, there was a knock on the glass of the window I was sitting near, and George's father waved his hand, heading for the door. Squeezing through the crowd of people waiting for their coffee, Jack made his way to the table. He was alone. I stood up and shook his hand, then we both sat down. Your wife isn't coming? I asked. No, after reading the CBD, I decided it would be best if I came alone. Janice has been having high blood pressure lately, so I left her at home. He said, motioning for the waitress to bring coffee. Yeah, you're probably right. Adam, and that slanderous little shit got it right, because I think you should sue him. Jack, suing would cost a lot of money. It wouldn't get in the papers, and it's unlikely to be successful since it's true. What do... The waitress came in with coffee, and he waited for her to leave. What do you mean by saying it's true? Last night, the police broke into my apartment after a noise complaint and found my best man and one of the groomsmen doing it with Georgia in our bed. I said quietly, They must have made her do it. He tried to remain calm. They thought so at first, but it turns out they didn't. Don't be ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. My daughter would never do anything like that. The calmness faded away, and he was nearly foaming at the mouth. I'm sorry, Jack, but the pictures don't lie. The wedding is off. 
bullshit. It was the first time I'd ever heard him curse. People fake pictures all the time. Jack was a seeing is believing kind of guy, and I didn't want to offend him, but I wasn't going to be the bad guy either. I picked up my phone and swiped my finger across the screen. Opening the browser, I found the security footage again. It doesn't mean anything. It was probably staged with an actress. He placed my phone face down on the table. This is a live feed from my apartment. It's happening right now. What kind of sick freak are you? I'm so glad Doris wasn't here for your deranged fantasies. When I tell Georgia, she won't touch you within ten feet, he started to rise from his seat. Sit the hell down, Jack! I shouted, causing everyone in the bakery to turn in our direction. He sat down with a stunned expression on his face. I know I'd never swore in front of him before, let alone scolded him. Give me your phone, he wouldn't budge. Now, Jack. He gave me his phone. And I looked through my contacts and found George's number. I pressed the call button, then flipped my phone, which was lying face down on the table. The action on the screen stopped as Georgia reached for her phone on the coffee table. Jack flipped the phone over, slumping down before my eyes. He suddenly looked very old and frail. I'm sorry, Jack, but you should have known. I hope you don't lose too many deposits, but three weeks before the wedding I'd say you will. You and Janice don't deserve this, but I can't go through with it. He cried, but didn't say anything, just nodded. He wiped his eyes and asked in a whisper. Have you told her yet? No. She was asleep when I left this morning to meet the policeman in charge of the case. Good God, she doesn't know that you know and... And she's with that guy again? It's not the same guy. Come on, Jack. Let's get out of here and take a walk in the park. We both need some fresh air. I left my coffee money on the table, and we left. We walked for half an hour, talking about everything but Georgia. He had already calmed down and wanted to go home, so we walked over to the cab stand. When are you going to tell her? asked Jack. When she has a spare minute. It was hard to keep the bitterness out of my voice. Jack turned away. Part of me still loves her, Jack. Part of me thinks this is a nightmare that I'll wake up from, and everything will be the same. That's what makes me feel so awful, because the rest of me wants to destroy her and all the men who touched her. You can let me know before you do that, because I'll come and get her. Take her home. Tears came to her eyes again. A father can't stop loving his daughter. Yeah, sure, Jack. I'll let you know. We shook hands awkwardly, and he got into the first cab he could find. I turned around and continued walking, contemplating my next move. I found a quiet spot in the park and checked the CCTV footage again. The action had stopped. Georgia was wearing her robe again, and Jeff was tying the laces on his shoes. He really was a stupid bastard. He was engaged to the daughter of one of the richest women in Australia. Penny Rainhill was the daughter of Jackie Rainhill, who, along with a Chinese consortium, owned the three largest iron ore mines in the Pilbara, Western Australia, as well as one of the richest gold and copper deposits ever discovered in Australia. She is now on the list of the world's richest women, with a fortune estimated at $6 billion. Of course, Penny was not stunning, but she possessed good proportions. She was not obese, but she was very well-rounded. She had chubby cheeks on her face that almost glowed a bright red light if she got tense or drunk, and to top it all off, she wore curly red hair that could be described as unruly. But despite all that, she was a great girl. She was a lot of fun to be with, and she was in love with Jeff. You can marry more in five minutes than you can earn in a lifetime, was my father's favorite saying. I might not be able to accuse Jeff of anything, but I was sure I could ruin his upcoming wedding if Penny looked at my surveillance tapes. Jeff worked for her family company too, so I guess his job would be over too. This was my revenge, except for my boss, but I had a plan for that too. All that was left was to get Georgia's cooperation, and I think I had something to make sure she met my needs. Heading home, I was very curious to see how Georgia was going to handle our situation. When I got home, Georgia was gone. I wasn't expecting that, but it delayed the impending confrontation a bit. Besides, it gave me time to make a commercial for Penny. 
Jeff's conversation with Georgia when he arrived was also interesting. He was sent by Carl and Tom's lawyers to find out what she had told the police. A charge of witness tampering came to mind, but there was no point in that Penny would probably come up with a far more heinous punishment. I was making dinner around 5 p.m. when the apartment door opened. There was the clatter of heels on the wooden floor, and Georgia and one of her bridesmaids, Shelly, walked into the living room. Apparently, it was a matter of safety in numbers. They saw me in the kitchen and headed toward me, and as they got closer, Georgia opened her arms to hug me and said, Adam, honey, how are you there? We were so worried. She snorted as if holding back tears. I didn't respond to the hug, continuing to keep my arms at my side. I tried to keep my voice steady. I've been busy talking to the police, my boss, and your father. Georgia tensed, caught off guard, but she held on manfully. Shelley came to explain how they spiked my drinks at the bachelorette party and I got kicked out of the nightclub. Tom and Carl were there and offered to drive me home, and that's when they took advantage of me. She tried to hug me again, but I pulled away. Really? Is that what happened, Shelley? I said sarcastically. Yeah, just like Georgia said. It was just a little fun that got out of hand. And you served her coffee before she entertained Jeff this morning. Oh, that was delightful. Shelley opened her mouth, trying to comprehend my words. Georgia took a step back as if I'd hit her. She looked wildly back and forth at Shelley and me, trying to think of what to say. Shelley was the first to regain her speech. You're on your own now, girlfriend, she hissed, turning and walking toward the front door. Georgia tried to grab her to hold her in place, but Shelley shoved her off, unleashing a parting volley at her. I knew you were a party girl, but I didn't realize you were such a slut. The door slammed shut, and Georgia and I were left alone. She turned to me again. Now she was crying, and it would be better to say sobbing. She mumbled how sorry she was, and how I should have stayed with her in the morning, and then this wouldn't have happened. Why did it always have to be someone else's fault? Will you just shut up? I shouted. Do you really think I care about your excuses and lies? But I was drunk, and I was upset this morning, and that's only twice. I'll be good, please. You really are pathetic. I took a long puff to finish the beer I'd opened earlier. Only twice? I tried to imitate Tom's deep voice. God, I missed your ass so much. And then George. And you, Tom, too. Once again, a shocked expression appeared on George's face. But, but, but how? Apparently her tongue had been overworked from the night before. Remember when you moved in? I told you about the security system and the cameras? Yes, but you said you didn't use them. I don't use them, but they still work 24-7. I thought the police would want a copy for proof, but unfortunately, it only confirmed that you are a lying whore. The tears were flowing for real now, a steady stream streaming down her face. She was squatting, leaning against the wall. She looked pathetic, small and sad and pathetic. I decided that I would ask the sergeant to forget about the perjury charge, but I wouldn't tell her about it until I could figure out why she had done it, if she even knew. I walked over and lifted Georgia to her feet and helped her to sit at the kitchen table. She tried to cling to me, but I pulled away grabbed two beers from the fridge, and sat down across from her. Opening a beer, I set one in front of her and took a sip from mine. I want you to know that we're done, okay? She nodded her head. The policeman wanted to know if I wanted him to charge you with perjury. I have until six o'clock tonight to let him know. So you have half an hour to answer my questions truthfully, and I'll tell him to forget about you. Please, Adam, don't, I interrupted her. Answer my questions or wait for the police. She nodded her head, took the beer I'd brought her, and took a long sip. A friend from town told me you slept with your boss. Is that true? Georgia nodded her head again, wiping her tears with the back of her palm. And for how long? About nine months, she replied, snorting loudly. You were only there for ten. What the hell? I was recruited into a new strike team. We were supposed to be the head part of a push into the corporate market. Georgia snorted. 
My boss, Jeremy, called me into his office a month later. He wasn't happy. She snorted again. We applied for three corporate clients and missed every one of them. Georgia stopped and took another drink. Her sniffling was driving me crazy, so I reached over to the sideboard and grabbed a box of tissues. She blew her nose loudly and continued. Inet, Jim said he didn't think I was contributing enough to the team. I told him I was working harder than the others. He went around his desk and stood in front of me. He said that I was hired because of my considerable strengths and that it was time to flaunt them. Exactly. Why did you put up with that? It's normal for you. You're the miracle child. The youngest guy to get a million dollar bonus. I was on my third job in two years and I wanted to make a name for myself. The tears were forgotten as anger surged through them. Entertaining your boss? That's one way to get a reputation, but not a very good one. I brought them four big bills. I couldn't believe she was bragging about being a corporate whore. And, and now they're going to throw you to the curb and you're going to have to start turning tricks for real. I don't think so. Jeremy wanted backup, so I had to secretly record some of the meetings. I kept copies to cover myself. Now that was interesting. If I could get a copy of her and Mr. Turnbull, I might be able to screw the jerk. Where do you keep the copies? I asked, hoping it wasn't at work. On my desk at work? Shit! I exclaimed, slamming the beer bottle down on the desk. What's the matter? Georgia looked startled. I'd like a copy of one with you and Mr. Turnbull. I stood up and walked over to the window. I never... I turned around and gave her a hard stare. Well, I... How did you figure that out? She finally asked. It's obvious, isn't it? You share your assets to get new customers. Our bank is a new customer. That's all you want. If you're so desperate to see it, I'll go to work and make a copy, shouted Georgia, standing up abruptly, causing her chair to fall over. And she stomped over to the hall table and grabbed her keys. You're not going through the front door! I called out to her. She stopped and turned to me. What do you mean? Your boss will cover his tracks. You'll be met at the door by a guard with a box of your stuff. There's no way they'll let you near the computer. Georgia bit her lip. She always did that when in doubt. Tossing her keys on the desk, she walked back to me and disappeared into the office. I walked to the door and peeked inside. Georgia was sitting in my chair, booting up my computer. I can remotely access my computer, she announced triumphantly. I continued to watch as she typed in the access code, then repeated it and typed again. Her shoulders slumped as she realized I was right. She was locked out. Damn idiots! She slumped back into her chair, apparently beaten, then sat back in it with renewed enthusiasm. There's a back door to Jeremy's computer that I used to put video files on it. Yes, yes, I'm in. I moved behind the chair. Copy everything. I said, you need leverage to negotiate a severance package. More importantly, I needed to screw up my boss's life somehow. I walked out, leaving her, and about 20 minutes later, Georgia came out of the office, grinning and waving a portable hard drive. Found all the fun stuff. Did you get copies of his incoming and outgoing emails? I asked hopefully. Yeah, but I thought... I raised my hand. Stop. I've seen so much of you in action in the last 24 hours that I've had enough for the rest of my life. I just want to back up in case the bank starts coming after me too. But, I thought, maybe we could try again? Sell everything? Move abroad? Start fresh? Unfortunately, there's nothing fresh about you, Georgia. When I saw you with Tom and Carl, I thought maybe you were drunk. But today with Jeff? You need help, but I'm not going to stick around to see the results. She cried again, and I walked over to her and picked up the portable hard drive, then walked past her into the office. Georgia ran into the bedroom and I heard the door slam. The hard drive was better than I'd hoped. It turned out that Jeremy and Mr. Turnbull were old high school friends. They had sent each other many letters about Georgia and her talents. However, that wasn't even the most interesting part. It turned out they'd conspired to defraud the bank. Mr. Turnbull wanted to replenish his pension fund, so he asked Jeremy to inflate the tender price for a PR contract. He approved it, 
but Jeremy only put the right price on the company's ledger. They took the difference and split it 50-50. I called Sergeant Potts, he answered on the second ring. I thought you'd forgotten, he said. I looked at my watch, 6.05 p.m. No, just wanted to make sure I made the right decision. So what's up? He asked, yawning. Don't confront her. I think she'll be uncomfortable without it. Do you know anyone in the fraud squad? Perhaps, he answered cautiously. Why do you ask? I'll tell you later, I replied, evading his question, not wanting to reveal too much. Oh dear, he grinned. Who will end up as the recipient this time? We'll wait and see. Saying goodbye, I hung up the phone. Then I called Georgia's father to come and pick her up. I wanted to sleep in my own bed tonight. Then I downloaded a copy of the morning session with Jeff and Georgia and sent it to Penny, his fiancée. It was harder than I thought it would be. I agonized over the send button before clicking it. It was going to hurt, but hopefully keep her out of more trouble. Jack arrived about 40 minutes later. It took a while to convince Georgia to come out of the bedroom, but eventually she did. I gathered her clothes and they left. My cell phone rang. It was Eric from the paper. Did you enjoy my column today? He asked, his voice full of enthusiasm. Yes, I replied without much enthusiasm. Come on, we didn't chicken out, did we? I wanted to get back at them, but I heard others too. I thought of Jack and Janice. There's always collateral damage in war. Who do you want me to nail tomorrow? I thought about it for a bit. Are you still there? Asked Eric. Yeah, just thinking about it. He looked like a crow circling over a corpse hoping for a new batch of food. The two groomsmen who were caught with Georgia and one other will be charged with felonies tomorrow. Sorry, buddy, but three bankers caught with a joint is not the way to go, he said, showing his frustration. Not possession charges, but importation and delivery, I added. Now that's better. High-flying bankers. Eric laughed. Do you have anything else for me, buddy? Or have we already worked out that layer? I'll contact you if I have anything else. I tried to be casual. I'd had enough for the day. I turned off the phone, disconnected the landline, closed all the blinds and tried to get some sleep. At 9.30 the next morning, someone knocked on my door. I got up and went to answer it. It was Greg, the building caretaker. Adam, dude, what's wrong with your phone? I've been trying to call you. I just turned them off. I wanted to get some sleep without interference. What's the matter? Said I a little annoyed. Didn't Those guys have been waiting for you downstairs for an hour. He stepped back and I saw one guy in a security guard uniform holding a box and another in a suit. The suit was holding a piece of paper. Mr. Adam Spencer? Yes, I replied. I'm from the bank's legal department. I'm here to inform you that your contract with us has been canceled under Section 112B. In other words, you have given the bank a bad reputation. Your contract will be terminated, I have a severance check for two weeks' pay, and James has the personal items from your desk. He handed me the check, and the guard set the box on the floor. I was stunned. They were already halfway to the elevator when I came to my senses. Wait a minute. Three weeks ago, I signed a new contract that guarantees me nine months' salary plus 50% of my last bonus. I shouted after them. I don't know anything about that, sir. If you want to deal with the bank, I suggest you see a lawyer. Suit said, following the guard to the elevator. The building manager shrugged and followed the others. Sorry, buddy. I picked up the box and carried it inside. It only contained the contents of my desk drawers and a few photos. I wasn't going to let these creeps get away with this. I called the lawyer who had checked out my recent contract before I signed it. From what I understand, your new contract is effective immediately, but knowing the legal documents, you can challenge any option. Have you been paid yet? He asked hopefully. No, the money is due in my account this Thursday, replied I. Well, so that's why they're trying so hard. They want you to fight for them. How do you want to proceed? I can start the trial right now and we can have a preliminary hearing as early as the end of this month. Damn lawyers. Is there any way I can have a chat with my boss at the office before then? 
I have something that might change his mind about their position. It's not, uh, illegal, is it? He asked. Not what I did. Isn't anything missing from the box you usually keep in the office? No. Wait a minute. I have a set of golf clubs in the storage room next to the executive dining room. Great. And how much are they worth? About 20000 said I carelessly. Bullshit. Are they gold-plated? Not platinum, but with gold inlays. A nice set of Honda clubs. Well, half a set. A full set costs about 50 the lawyer whistled. I'll start drafting an order to allow access to them. Can you be done by one o'clock today? I wanted to strike back right away. I don't know, it won't give me much time, and I have other things to do, and... Meet me out front with the order, and I'll give you the golf clubs. I interrupted. Hell yeah, I'll see you there. I ate breakfast and headed to the office to get ready for the afternoon confrontation. Mr. Turnbull was always in the executive dining room between 12.30 and 1.30 p.m., so the noise outside would surely get his attention. I couldn't resist checking the Herald website to see what Eric had written. He managed to make a joke about high-flying bankers, and there was also an article about the canceled engagement of a billion-dollar heiress. I didn't mention Penny and Jeff. I wonder where he got that from. One o'clock came quickly, and I waited on the plaza in front of the bank building. The lawyer was five minutes late and came up to me and pulled some sort of document out of his pocket, waving it around like a trophy. I had to wait until the magistrate finished his morning session to sign it, but here it is. And what does it authorize me to do? I asked as we headed for the front door. I was hoping for general admission, but this guy played hardball and he's only allowing you to go indoors and get your golf clubs. Straight in and right out. I hope that's all I need. We were already at the front door. Inside, the guard who had earlier returned the contents of the office to me moved to stop me. Excuse me, sir. I've been asked to keep you out of the building. He stood in front of me and gestured for the other two guards to help him. I held a legal document in front of his face. This is a court order authorizing me access to the building. Please move out of the way. I tried to walk past, but he blocked my path anyway. I have to check this first. He took the ordinance and spoke into a microphone attached to his shoulder. A couple minutes later, the elevator doors opened, and the same little asshole who had talked to me this morning stepped out. He took the court order from the guard, put on his reading glasses, and quickly flipped through it. Someone's had a busy morning, he said, breaking away from the papers. This only authorizes you to go to the storeroom and back, no detours of any kind. He handed the order back to me, then turned to the guard. Escort him to the executive storage room, then come back here and throw his ass outside. After that, he just turned and walked back to the elevator. I moved toward the elevators on the left, holding the guard by the shoulder. In the storeroom, I grabbed my clubs, then stepped out into the hallway, determined to make a scene. Some bastard stole my putter. I dropped my clubs and headed down the hallway toward the executive dining room. You can't go in there, sir, said the guard, grabbing my arm but missing. I dashed into the dining room, but the guard was more nimble than I thought. He grabbed me just as I was in the doorway. I struggled to get free, but he was stronger than he looked. Hearing the noise, Mr. Turnbull appeared in the doorway. What the hell is that noise? he shouted, then realized who it was. What the hell is he doing here? Excuse me, sir. He has a court order said the guard, lifting me off the floor by my collar. I stopped resisting as my victim was right in front of me. Mr. Turnbull, it's good to see you too, said I with sarcasm in my voice. I thought you might want to reconsider my severance package. No way. He pointed at the guard. Get that low life out of here, now. I pulled a flash drive out of my pocket and tossed it to him. You better watch this when you get a chance but not when your wife is around. Mr. Turnbull's eyes narrowed. What are you talking about? Call Jeremy and he'll tell you. I spat. What if he leaves here? The mention of Jeremy's name didn't startle him. Apparently, he figured the matter was settled. Putting the flash drive in his pocket, he walked back into the dining room. 
the guard began dragging me down the hallway. You have 24 hours. I think you have my cell phone number. I shouted towards the closing door. I grabbed the batons on my way back. The guard didn't let go of my arm until I was on the front yard. My parasite, excuse me, my lawyer, was already waiting and returned my clubs to me. I was quite happy. If I got the deal I signed up for three weeks ago, I could buy another set. I was a little worried when I didn't hear anything before going to bed. At 11.30, my phone beeped for a text message to come in. Meet at Centennial Park Coffee Shop at 6.45 a.m. Gotcha. The next morning, I headed to the park at 6.30, hoping to get there first. Apparently, Mr. Turnbull had the same idea as I walked on one side and he walked on the other. We huddled awkwardly together, keeping about three meters apart. What do you want for the tape? He asked angrily. What I'm owed under the new contract. I answered him in the same way. That contract doesn't run until Thursday. That's a disputed fact, and I don't have time to deal with our court system. I never took you for a blackmailer. He roared, his face reddening. I never mistook you for an asshole who entertains his employee's fiancé, replied I. We stood there scowling at each other until Mr. Turnbull backed off. Okay, but I need the photos and any copies you have. Easy. You'll get the photos when I have a signed document from the bank confirming my eligibility. You'll get them today. He turned to leave. One more thing. I want the little legal eagle you sent yesterday to bring the documents. This was going to be fun. Anything else? He asked sarcastically. No, that's all I want, said I, smiling. Nah, he stepped back a little and then came back closer this time. You know you'll never work in this town. No, let it be this country. Never again. You little shit, he hissed. Nice doing business with you, said I with a laugh as he walked away. I still had the emails between Turnbull and Jeremy and would turn them over to the fraud squad as soon as the money arrived in my bank account. The next few days went relatively smoothly for me. The next morning, a shitty little legal eagle from the bank showed up on my doorstep with some forms for me to sign. He left me a copy and told me the money would be paid on Thursday. I gave him an envelope with a flash drive and a small portable hard drive, and he left with his tail between his legs. Thursday morning, Jack and Doris came over and picked up the rest of Georgia's stuff. They had a problem with Georgia. She got drunk and went to her boss's house to give him a scandal in front of his wife. They called the police, who warned her to go home, and then picked her up for DUI. She tested the system and immediately lost her license. Tom, Carl, and Tony were released on bail, but the prosecutor turned out to be a hard ass. He appeared on corporate morning television. He didn't mention specific facts so as not to jeopardize the cases, but the conclusion was self-evident especially when the hourly news showed the three guys coming out of the courtroom and trying to hide their faces. It was like Jeff had vanished off the face of the earth. I talked to Eric, and he said there was a rumor going around that he'd been sent to some South American shithole by Penny's mom. The company was exploring for minerals there, and the natives weren't too happy about it. Thursday afternoon at 4.55 p.m., my bank account was $720,000 richer, and at 4.59 p.m., I was on the phone with Sergeant Potts. The next morning, two detectives from the fraud squad and a guy from the Investment and Securities Division came to see me. I showed them the emails. They claimed it looked like a conspiracy to commit fraud. Then followed the all-important question. How did you get these emails? I had to admit that they were not obtained legally. The detectives were getting a little annoyed, feeling they had wasted their time. We know all these big guys are running scams, but they're surrounded by big legal fences. We can't drag them in here and make them tell their story. The securities guy wasn't so concerned. Calm down, guys. We're treating these letters as pointers on where to look. It'll take some time, but there will be a paper trail. It's best to forget that we've even seen this correspondence. I don't want to jeopardize any convictions. They left, and I was left to myself. Mr. Turnbull seemed to have started a rumor about me. I contacted competing banks with job offers, 
but the human resources people wouldn't return my calls. I was walking down the street outside my building, wondering what I should do, when a black car pulled up to the curb next to me. The window rolled down, and in the back seat was Penny Rainhill. You look as lost as I feel, she said seriously, and then a wide smile blossomed on her face. I've refueled the company jet, and I'm waiting for you on the tarmac. Do you want to get some rest? Mommy, sit around feeling sorry for yourself or go on vacation. I hesitated, rubbing my chin. Give me five minutes and I'll pack a suitcase. Screw it. Just get in. You won't need a lot of clothes where we're going. And where are we going? I asked, throwing caution to the wind and opening the car door. To a family compound in Mauritius. It has its own beach, pool, golf course, and chef. Let's go, I exclaimed as she reached forward and tapped on the glass separating the front and back seats to signal the driver to go to the airport. Twenty-five minutes later, we were already seated in the Rhinehill family's Gulfstream airplane and on our way. Three weeks had turned into five months, a fantastic vacation. Had I hooked up with Penny? Sure, and with the stewardess and the maid and half a dozen local girls. Penny was just a crazy girl. When she decided to have some fun, it was an amazing sight, but that's another story. Why did I come back? It's very simple. I wanted a front row seat at Mr. Turnbull's fraud and racketeering hearings. He walked in at the beginning of the hearing, all nice and easy, chatting with his team of lawyers. The bank supported him, so he had a lead and assistant barrister, two assistants and a solicitor. By the end of the first day, his tie was down beads of sweat appearing on his face as he spoke anxiously to his solicitor. The case was not going well. The prosecution was very thorough and presented a long and complicated paper trail that linked Mr. Turnbull to Jeremy and the PR deal. At the end of the day, it emerged that Jeremy had turned himself in the day before. He had admitted wrongdoing and was going to plead guilty to a slightly lesser charge in exchange for testifying against his co-conspirators. The bank, sensing the inevitable, withdrew its support. On the second day, Mr. Turnbull came to the hearing in a depressed state, with only a lawyer for briefing. One of the bank's legal department made a statement to the court that the bank was no longer providing legal assistance to Mr. Turnbull and intended to take civil action against him to try to recover some of the funds. With no serious faces left in the room, the prosecution wrapped up the case fairly quickly. When it was the defense's turn, it showed its desperation by presenting a hard drive with photos of Mr. Turnbull, Jeremy, and Georgia. They claimed that Jeremy had blackmailed him into the conspiracy after Georgia had secretly taped him. The press rushed to the doors, smartphones at the ready to ring the newsrooms with juicy gossip. This put Georgia into the fray, and she was summoned to court. Jeremy had to go back to the dock, too. The whole sordid saga played out in front of the press, and for a week, it was the main topic of newspapers and television broadcasts. Mr. Turnbull's defense was at its best until the prosecutor called Tom and Carl to the bench. They explained that Mr. Turnbull's enthusiasm for his old high school friends predated the video. The defendants tried to discredit them because they were serving a four-year prison sentence, but their words apparently resonated with the judge. He deemed the case worth pursuing and referred Mr. Turnbull to trial. After the circus of taking the case to trial, it turned out that Mr. Turnbull lost his appetite for fighting, changed his plea of guilty, and got two and a half years in prison. I wish I could say he ended up penniless and alone, but we all know those white-collar types are too smart for that. Shortly before his indictment, he must have gotten word that the securities people were sniffing around for something. He transferred most of his assets into his wife's name, whereupon she started divorce proceedings. By the time of the trial, he was allegedly living in his son's garage and was declared bankrupt with no assets. No doubt there will be a reconciliation upon release, and he will be back on the streets. The head of the Department of Public Prosecutions must have enjoyed being the center of attention, so after Mr. Turnbull blanched and pleaded guilty, he took on Jeremy and Georgia. Jeremy only managed to settle on a charge of conspiracy to commit fraud, but the prosecutor added. Using a surveillance device to record private acts without consent, 
filming obscene acts, and using a telecommunications network to facilitate the offense. Extortion using threats. Some of these offenses were mere misdemeanors, but all of them added up to a total, and he ended up getting three years behind bars. Georgia received probation for recording without consent and filming obscene acts. However, her face was in the news more than once during the trial, and her reputation took a hit. Some of the dirt stuck to me, even though I was only a supporting actor in the show. There was speculation at various times about my involvement in the case. Apparently, I was labeled as an unstable cuckold in the financial sector. My job prospects never improved. So, if no one gives you a job, you have to create your own. I started a venture capital business specifically for environmental projects. I haven't made a fortune, but I'm surviving and hopefully doing good things. Penny and I remained close, but she was a player and I wasn't. I am still on the prowl, but I have trust issues that are getting in the way. I've just embarked on a wetland restoration project about 700 kilometers west of Sydney, in the real outback. Two mining companies and a bank have invested money to bolster their corporate image. I'll be living in an old homestead that was once the main home for a 100 acre sheep station on the Darling River. I hope the clean air and big sky country will change my luck. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.